This video evolves. I am Sayyid Shabahat Ali, and you're watching Fault Times. Today, the world is full of surprises. Russia and Ukraine war, a subject that we have been following and pursuing more than any other television channel in the country, has taken a very interesting twist. This time, Wagner Group, a key player in the war against Ukraine, has uh, turned their weapons toward Moscow. Not only they have left their field in Ukraine, but also started a march toward the capital of Russia. President of Russia has made uh, an address, has addressed the nation today, wherein he has hinted to take decisive action against those who have stood against Mother Russia. Importantly and interestingly, Wagner Group has received very little resistance so far. Initially, they were targeted by Air Force from the city of Rostov, but Wagner Group then took control of Rostov's airport and then have been progressing toward the capital, Moscow. Is it going to be such an easy battle for, for the Wagner Group? Is the state of Russia in a state of turmoil at the moment? And more importantly, if these troops were so well trained, why could not they take uh, a decisive action in Ukraine, a war that they could not conclude during last one and a half year? To address all of these issues in today's program, I have invited Mr. Mohammed Tamur, who is one of the leading experts on affairs related to Russia and Pakistan. Tamur, I welcome you to the show. Thank you for having me. First time we are having you in the studio. Yeah, it's good to be here. Tamur, what is exactly happening in, in Russia? This is very surprising. Wagner's not only have taken a complete U-turn, and not only have switched sides, but the progress that they're making is formidable. Well, the current developments are very much strikingly surprising, especially for me because I um, believed that uh, Wagner, which has been so loyal to the Russian cause inside of Ukraine, has automatically or suddenly turned against the very government that it, was, it has been supporting for uh, as long as the special military operation inside of Ukraine has been taking place. But uh, ever since yesterday, last night, the uh, head of the Wagner military group, uh, Yevgeny Prigozhin, claimed that uh, his troops were uh, targeted by a rocket attack uh, in the forward field areas in which a large number of his uh, militants were killed by the Russian forces themselves. So, uh, he, has de he decided to march towards uh, Moscow, a march of peace, what he calls, uh, to remove the evil uh, namely uh, the Minister of Defense of the Russian Federation as well as General Grasimov. Uh, so first he, uh, his troops entered uh, Rostov-on-Don region and there after taking over different military headquarters they started to move towards Voronezh and from Voronezh they moved towards Lipetsk. And, and, and if uh, I am not mistaken Rostov was also the front where uh, the war of Ukraine was being technically yes, monitored. it from. was one of the uh, most significant tactical and operational uh, hubs from where the Russian troops were being supplied and reinforced who were fighting on the front lines in Ukraine. Now, let's talk about uh, this attack that you, you have said uh, was made through a missile. He has given a video statement. I was watching him uh, this day earlier. And, and he said that this missile was struck by the Russian forces. Now, why would Russian forces strike with a missile to the personnel who are representing their military in in, in middle of a battle? Exactly. And also, uh, Mr. Uh, Yevgeny Prigozhin also failed to give any substantial video or, do, uh, or some other pictorial proof of that uh, attack by the Russian forces on his uh, militants. Uh, but you know, uh, in the modern times, it is a war of narratives. And he's just simply trying to uh, attain and acquire more and more sympathy uh, of the Russian people and of all the other servicemen uh, of Russia for his cause. Uh, so uh, despite the lack of evidence that he has presented, uh, in my humble opinion, the kind of attack that he has mustered up uh, and, uh, you know, the way he is moving towards Moscow uh, I don't think so that it was a reflex uh, 
from Mr. Yevgeny and he has been planning this uh, attack on Moscow for at least a considerable time now because the way his troops are moving in unison, uh, the coordinated attacks and uh, repulsion uh, attacks that uh, his troops have been carrying out against the uh, Russian forces who have, which have been deployed in various uh, administrative regions of Russia. I don't think so that it was uh, something that just happened overnight. It was a pre-planned uh, onslaught. Uh, planned by Mr. Yevgeny uh, for quite some time now. Uh, let me read a statement uh, that I was um, that I have taken from Al Jazeera's website, and it said that General Sergei uh, Sovokin, who is a general of Russian uh, army, by the way, has made a statement wherein he has said, uh, to addressing to Wagner Group, that you must do this before it's too late. Uh, stop the convoys. Return back to the bases. Report to your stations. Apparently, there was a move. Uh, where in Russia was trying to take the fighters of Wagner Group into the mainstream military. Uh, it reminds me of something similar which is happening in Sudan where a paramilitary force yes. has been tried to get into the mainstream military and, and it went into a, a full-scale war. So uh, was it something that was cooking up for quite a while, Damur, and that we missed to, to perhaps uh, um, anticipate in, in time? Uh, of course, I think uh, the developments that have re recently taken place, they were cooking up for quite some time now. It is an open secret that uh, Mr. Prigozhin was no, not a fan of uh, the Ministry of Defense of the Russian Federation or its top leadership. And uh, the squabbles between the Ministry of Defense leadership, particularly the Defense Minister Sergei Shoigu and General Grasimov, versus uh, Mr. Yevgeny Prigozhin have been taking place ever since the battle for Bakhmut was taking place uh, since last year. So things were cooking up and they were slowly and gradually the frustration was building up on both sides. And Mr. Uh, Prigozhin was behaving like Icarus in my humble opinion he, and uh, because of his statements it seemed like he was flying way too close to the sun. And I think we are just about to see the climax of this um, story. And I strongly believe that uh, although the context of this entire development spans over a very uh, long period of time, but the actual uh, trust of the matter is the power dynamics between uh, Mr. Prigozhin as well as the Ministry of Russian Ministry of Defense. What Ministry of Defense tried to do la uh, earlier this month was to, uh, uh, you know, um, attract all the other uh, groups, different independent groups who were fighting on the behest of the Russian Federation inside of Ukraine to sign a contract with the Russian Ministry of Defense so that a consolidated and concerted effort can be made by the Russian military leadership in order to organize and reorient the Russian onslaught inside of Ukraine. And Mr. Prigozhin outrightly rejected that since uh, he had his own bone to pick with Mr. Shoigu. No, not only that, but also Mr. Prigozhin um, has uh, challenge the very premise of this war. He has said not only his uh, forces were not provide sufficient ammunition, but he's also said that uh, while the generals are sitting in their uh, beautifully made offices, it is his troops that are taking the brunt of the war. Uh, not only that, he also said that this war should not have been fought to begin with. Yes. Now, this is a major U-turn that he has taken. Exactly. Uh, something we are not familiar with when we talk about this Wagner group because they are engaged in many other fronts and we'll talk about that later. So, uh, why such a big U-turn? I mean, this is... This, this must have had a history of it. Well, of course, you see, uh, this, uh, this major U-turn uh, did not happen overnight. Slowly and gradually, his statements were uh, turning up the heat uh, as far as the Russian Ministry of Defense is concerned. Uh, it is no uh, secret that, yes, Russian troops were facing some sort of shortage of weapons and ammunitions ever since the onslaught uh, or the Russian uh, invasion of Ukraine began. Uh, and Mr. Prigozhin, like I mentioned, uh, this is a war of narratives. And he uh, picked up very wisely the different uh, chinks in the armor of Russian Ministry of Defense and he effectively used them in order to uh, solidify and consolidate his own uh, narrative or ante against the uh, Russian military leadership. And uh, this shortage of weapons and his troops not being provided enough ammunition to carry out their offensive against uh, the Ukrainian armed forces in the Battle of Bakhmut seems to be one of the attempts to hide or to divert the attention of the people from his own shortcomings while his troops were fighting in Bakhmut and were unable to capture 
the town for at least over 10 months. Tamur, uh, since we are quite short of time, there are two important things that I want you to quickly sure. touch upon before this segment uh, loses the time that it's allocated. Sure. Uh, one is that uh, when the Wagonards have started retrieving back uh, the marching toward Moscow as of now when we speak, is this how vulnerable Russia's defense actually was? Uh, and does that mean that there is an immediate threat uh, as we can see on paper, they are 25, 30 or 40 kilometers away from Moscow. Is it how uh, weak the, the, the defense around Ukraine, uh, Russia was? Well, I don't believe that the Russian defenses were weak or the Russian state does not have the capability to address such challenges. But you have to keep this in mind that majority of the Russian troops, almost 390,000 of Russian troops are currently engaged inside of Ukraine. And in all their attention was focused on their operation, their special military operation inside the territory of Ukraine. They were not expecting that uh, such a large contingent of their own uh, uh, fighters would all of a sudden turn against them and would start marching Okay, uh, on the capital. So yes, the Russian leadership was taken by surprise. Uh, I would believe that they were not anticipating such courage, uh, if you allow me to use that word, uh, or such audacity on behalf of Mr. Yevgeny Prigozhin to uh, go against the interests of the state defined by President Putin the way he has done it uh, and march on Moscow and then uh, even threaten to take over the uh, headquarters of uh, uh, Russian Ministry of Defense as well as the general staff headquarters and demand from President Putin to remove these two individuals otherwise he is going to be the next military dictator of Russia. A and will it not uh, keep uh, the, the, the Ukrainian front occupied by Wagner's uh, more vulnerable uh, because uh, there are a lot of uh, progresses that these uh, troops had actually made inside Ukraine. So isn't Ukraine right now in a position to regain all these territories that are left uh, hollow by, by the Wagner's coming Well, I have been following the developments right after uh, such statements came out uh, from the Wagner group. Uh, the Russian troops and the reservist forces that were currently that are currently deployed on the front line, uh, they are repelling all of the attacks that have been launched by the Ukrainian armed forces over the last two days and uh, their air assault uh, groups, the Russian air assault groups are fighting on every other front from where the Ukrainian forces are engaging them. But you also have to keep in mind that after the takeover of Bakhmut uh, a few months ago by the Wagner troops, a majority of that contingent retreated and they were replaced by either regular Russian forces or the reservists that were, that were already in training. So uh, this would be very naive to say that uh, Russia would leave a town that it has gained after s going through so much trouble to uh, leave it so vulnerable because the Ukrainian armed forces had been launching massive attacks on the Bakhmut front ever since their counter-offensive began on June 4th. So yes, uh, it does leave certain chinks in the armor of the Russian defenses inside of Ukraine, particularly Bakhmut, but I don't think so that it would be an easy fight for the Ukrainian armed forces, despite the fact that uh, the Wagner troops are no longer fighting on the front lines at the moment. So are you convinced that uh, the Russian military, as of now when we speak, when most of them, as you said, already are engaged in different fronts of Ukraine, are they capable of defending Moscow or, or are we going to anticipate Moscow falling to the hands of Wagner's and then perhaps something bad happening to, to well, the Russian Well, as per my so knowledge, right now, uh, the Moscow administration has, impo uh, has uh, imposed a counter-terrorist, uh, uh, you can say, curfew sort of a thing, or at least uh, the administration has solidified its defenses around Moscow pro-Kremlin forces have uh, come outside and they have started digging trenches on the outskirts of Moscow. Uh, the bridges have been opened and all the main uh, highways leading up to Moscow have been shut down by the Moscow administration. Troops have been deployed, the police have been kept on high alert uh, and I don't think so that uh, the secu a security state like Russia would leave its uh, You didn't capital. factor in the air force that Russia is so proud of. We haven't seen air force putting up a major dent and the advances that are being made toward Moscow? Uh, well, I, uh, after all, you also have to understand that Wagner troops are also uh, Russian citizens. And the state of Russia would never uh, disproportionately launch such a massive, uh, you can say, firepower against their own people. First and foremost strategy would be to talk to Yevgeny Prigozhin. And the uh, head of the Wagner group has also offered the Russian Minister of Defense to come to Rostov and 
talk to him. So we are yet to see, and it's anybody's guess that when Wagner troops will finally reach the uh, borders of Moscow city, uh, how the things uh, how things will transpire, it is anybody's guess, and I hope that uh, sanity prevails. Thank you very much, Mohammed Amur, for being guest in this part of program. Pleasure. Ladies and gentlemen, this was Mohammed Tamur and he was telling us about the advances uh, that are made by Wagner Group and he's quite optimistic uh, that Russia's defense forces have all the capability uh, not only to engage the Wagner's but also to arrest their advances that they're making toward the capital. Uh, he also um, told us that 390,000 of the Russian military is at the moment engaged on the front of Ukraine. Moving toward the second topic of our program is a news item uh, that have been recently flashed in many newspapers reading that Pakistan has negated having any formal talks with Tariqe Taliban Pakistan. Uh, now this is not very surprising because Tariqe Taliban Pakistan uh, has been behaving quite irrationally uh, ever since this government has taken control. And not only if they have made several attacks, but have also made some demands uh, that certainly uh, a democratically elected government uh, cannot say yes to. And uh, uh, several different uh, levels of talks that uh, both the sides have, I mean, the pa government of Pakistan and government of Afghanistan have been engaged in. In, in the recent past have also not yielded any results. Now, a very interesting uh, development at the moment is that uh, in the persisting political turmoil, the mainstream discourse around the terrorist groups are uh, busy restructuring their networks. Uh, and when I say this, that's, that, that certainly means that groups like Tariqe Taliban, groups like Afghan uh, Taliban, uh, and most importantly, uh, the ISIK, uh, that is one of the major stakeholders uh, inside Afghanistan, all are at the different ends of uh, the same game. And uh, this makes it quite complex for the state of Pakistan to have a direct negotiation. To talk further about the subject, I have invited Sayyid uh, Khalid Muhammad, who is Director General of a think tank called Command 11. Uh, he is an independent analyst and an expert of the subject as well. Khalid Bhai, well, I welcome you to the show. It's always a pleasure, Shabbat. Always a pleasure to speak with you. Uh, Khalid Bhai, tell us uh, about the background of these talks that the government of Pakistan has said we are not uh, having at the moment with TTP. What's the background of this news item? Well, uh, the first problem you have is the, is the talks with uh, the TTP are never going to be successful because, first off, the two demands they put forward, um, that they will not adhere to any part of the Constitution of Pakistan, which is non-Sharia. Um, for any Pakistani, we accept that the Constitution of Pakistan is completely under Sharia. And for the TTP to say that the Constitution does not apply to them at all, um, that is one thing the government of Pakistan can't agree to. Secondly, um, the TTP has repeatedly demanded that the former Fata area, Deir, Malakand, and Swat be completely handed over to the TTP. Um, this emerged when the, 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 the story of the, the secret peace talks came out. Um, that's when we found out a lot of the, the terms that were going on. But to understand what's ha been happening between Pakistan and the TTP, um, for any time for negotiations to ever work and be successful, the government of Pakistan needs to negotiate from a position of strength. And thus far, Pakistan has not gotten to that point. The last time we were in a position of strength was when we completed operations at Arabi Um Pakistan army was successfully in, in clearing the SWAT district uh, they broke the backbone, the backbone, the financing, the the arms supply, the depots, and pushed the TTP across the, the the border into Afghanistan. That was the time when we could have literally broken the back. Um, what history has shown us is the TTP will pick up with guerrilla warfare against the Pakistan army, paramilitary groups, law enforcement groups, and then it's not the Taliban. Taliban has the, the front face because they are the government in, in the Afghanistan, but this is actually the Haqqani group that asked the government of Pakistan to sit down to negotiations. Um, one of the problems that we've seen with the negotiations the Pakistan government has is that the Pakistan government also always negotiates from a position of indifference. Um, I know that's very unfair to say because we have sacrificed 80,000 lives in this fight. 
But the government of Pakistan is not interested in solving the problem or the root of the problem that is creating terrorism. Um, they're only interested in fighting over the seats and who is going to rule over what is left of Pakistan after these wars happen. So it, it's clear to all of us here at Command 11 that uh, it's Siraj Haqqani who is driving the negotiations. Um, he's also the reason why the TTP has gained strength inside of Pakistan. He's been instrumental in, in a lot of things the TTP has been able to achieve, including the massive attacks on the, the Banjul Counterterrorism Center and the Kabul Counterterrorism Center, uh, the attacks on the police headquarters in Karachi and in Peshawar. This is something that could not have been done without the Haqqani Khalid, 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 if, I can, if I can stop you here, uh, it gives sure, birth sure. to a very important question, and that is about the settlement of TTP's militants that are living on this side of the border. Pakistan was right, trying right. to have them adjusted somewhere living inside Afghanistan because they have perhaps a better understanding with, with the people living on the other side. But what happened to this demand? Because Pakistan have been pursuing this, uh, to my understanding, for quite some time with the government of Afghanistan. It's been almost 18 months. Uh, it's been almost 18 months the government of Pakistan has been talking to the Taliban uh, about finding a way to reset the TTP fighters on the other side of the planet of the Iran border, not the TTP fighters on the Pakistan side, the ones on the Afghanistan side. Um, and it's a very interesting approach that was taken. The conversation was put forward. The Qatari government last week pledged $40 million to the Taliban to assist in the resettlement. The government of Pakistan also has pledged some money to help in the initial movement and setting up the initial housing there. Um, it's a very interesting idea, but Pakistan needs to be very careful that these refugee movements don't end up being new training camps for terrorists. Um, and I say that keeping the UN monitoring report that came out last month uh, in mind, where they cited Afghanistan as again becoming a global hub for the terrorist groups. But here's where the interesting part is. Uh, the two provinces in northern Afghanistan, Takar and Badakhshan, um, both of those provinces are very close to the Tajik border. I mean, they're literally on the Tajik border. And Badakhshan is a province that is majority Tajik. So they were never in, in favor <coughs> of the Pashtun to move there. Now, once the Tajik arm of the Taliban found out that they were moving Pashtuns into the area, they also created an, an uprising. And simultaneously, almost as both these things were happening, a greater Tajikistan vision was revived. And this is something like the greater Pashtunistan vision that was, that was driving segments of the Taliban in the past. So we need to be very careful. This movement is, is, is unbelievably weird. Because even the TPP spoke. Khalid Bhai, I'll, I'll, I'll cut you here. So you have just highlighted uh, a very important and a very pertinent point in this conversation. Uh, the greater Tajikistan is one of the threats that the government of Tajikistan is also talking about a lot. Uh, and to my understanding, uh, this has also got uh, an ethnic division with, with, within the Taliban's faction because the Taliban in Badakhshan are more Tajik in, in their they ethnicity. Are, and they are also disturbed with the movement of, 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 of uh, Pukhtuns to this side, but also they are uh, apprehensive of Taliban's expansion inside Tajikistan, which is something they have been talking about for quite some long. You have to understand, at, 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 at the point where, where we stood before, uh, the, 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 the province of Badakhshan had become a border. It was a buffer zone between Tajikistan and Afghanistan. The Pashtuns were below and the Tajiks were above. Now, when you start moving the Pashtuns into the Tajik area, number one, the Tajik majority is unsettled. Number two, they're not being moved there with the understanding that these are people that are going to bring benefit to the area. Um, they are being packaged as refugees coming from another province in central Afghanistan. They're not even being told they're TTP fighters moving into the area. What makes this even more interesting, though, is that the TTP itself says that it has not agreed to any three settlement plans, nor has the Taliban approached them with a similar plan. And Mohammed Korsani, the TTP spokesperson, two days ago issued a written uh, announcement saying that if they were told to move, they were to resist and kill anyone who forcibly attempts, attempts to make them, to move, make them move. So we're very unclear as to where this conversation is in the in the pipeline and whether it's actually reached success at any point, because the, the groups involved are still not clear as to what's happened.
Uh, and Khalid, what is the situation on Uzbek border? Because we understand that Uzbeks are one, also one of the thinnest cities in Afghanistan, uh, and some factions of them were also joining hands with Taliban a while ago. Well, here's the thing. Um, there's five countries involved in this conversation. I mean, when you really think about this, five countries involved. The Uzbeks, because after there was uh, uh, unrest because of the move to northern Afghanistan, the Taliban turned around and said, okay, we'll move you to eastern Afghanistan. And they came up with the Baghis province. Now, Baghis is right next to Uzbekistan, and we can be sure that the TTP will expand. Um, mm. it, this may even be a strategic move by the, the, the Taliban to move the TTP into another border area where they don't have the, the, the forces in, in power. You also have Iran on that border. Um, where you have the Taliban already embroiled in border conflicts. I mean, just last week there was a firing incident between the uh, the Iranian border forces and the, and the Taliban. If you decide to come towards the, the northern part of Pakistan, it's China, Tajikistan, and Pakistan that are affected. I mean, China, of course, will not be interested in the TTP moving into the, the, the Baghdashi province because it is one of Afghanistan's most resource-rich provinces. And those are the agreements the Chinese are negotiating for. So my, they will not want the TTP in that area. And Khalid, one very important thing that we have not addressed so far is ISKP. I don't understand which part of this uh, deal they are in because ISKP has enmity uh, with the uh, Afghan Taliban as well. And they're a party to conflict. They're the only party who's fighting uh, Afghan Taliban directly. So how do they see this development happening? Here's, here's the odd thing. When the announcement was made by the Taliban that they were moving the TTP into northern Afghanistan, almost a week later, ISKP made the same announcement that we are moving our fighters into northern Afghanistan to set up camps and set up our own our, our own governments there. Uh, two and a half weeks ago, the Taliban and ISKP ran a joint operation in Panjshir Valley against the, the combined Afghan resistance. Now, that threw things off for us. Last week, Bashir Safi, which is a well-known Afghani uh, member of, of the former government, made an announcement that the Taliban had agreed to host an intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance collection team at Bagram Air Force, uh, Air Force Base. And the team would include U.S. civilian contractors working with the Taliban's director of intelligence to counter ISKP threats in Afghanistan. Now, we are unclear as to what game the, the, the Taliban is playing. Because on one side, you are partnering with them against the resistance. On the other side, you're bringing the American uh, civilian contractors, which is a nice way of saying CIA. Thank you. In thank you very much, Khalid. Uh, we, are, we are short of time. We'll, we'll close it here. But thank you very much for uh, contributing in our show today. Ladies and gentlemen, this was uh, Sayyid Khalid from Command 11 Think Tank. We'll take a break and we'll join you back with the last segment of program. Stay with us. दुश्मन का हमला किसी भी वक्त मुतवक है इस इलाके में दुश्मन काफी फैल चुका है एहतियात से चलना एक नंबर नोट करें मेरी शहादत की सूरत में सबसे पहले इस नंबर पर इतला करें हम दोनों एक ही मंजिल के मुताबिक हैं न जाने किसके नसीब में पहले शहादत आ जाए जहां आप खड़े हो जगह सेफ नहीं है प्लीज आप अंदर आ जाए वतन की खातिर अगर जान अजीज कुर्बान हो जाए इससे अच्छी और क्या बात होती वर्दी और कफन अपना अपना ही अच्छा लगता पाकिस्तान Welcome back. Ladies and gentlemen, economics play a very pivotal and important role in the world that we inhabit today. Not only it's a major driver for all the conflicts, but it's also part of all the solutions that we, we have to these problems. The irony is that economics always start with the basic question of an economic problem where we are living with too much demands. And 
very few resources available to meet all these demands. Recently, Paris Summit has taken place in, in France, wherein the leaders from developing and developed world sat together alongside the financial institutions and uh, they deliberated on a number of areas, most importantly, uh, the impact of climate change that not only is causing damage to the environment, but is also causing a devastating economic crisis unfolding for few countries and Pakistan certainly being a very important country in this problem. Pakistan does not contribute much of the carbon dioxide but is one of the major recipients of the problems that the climate change is causing. It is also one of the countries that is facing economic problems uh, due to the increasing uh, debt crisis and this debt crisis has exacerbated for many countries including Pakistan and some other countries of Africa which are unable now to pay back the liabilities that they owe to the multilateral donors as well as to bilateral donors. To talk about this team, Fault Lines have prepared a package. Watch the package before I bring my guest to this part of my program. The crises are compounding shocks on developing countries. Crisis prone and that further exacerbates inequalities. The two day new Global Financial Peace Summit, hosted by French President Emmanuel Macron, seeks to find the financial solutions to the interleague global goals of tackling poverty, curbing planet heating emissions, and protecting nature. The summit comes amid growing recognition of the scale of the financial challenges ahead. Countries are calling for multilateral development banks to help unlock climate investments and significantly increase lending while stressing new debt arrangements. Pakistan has strongly engaged in the summit with a major focus on ensuring the summit's discussion fully take into account economic justice and a fair, comfortable and judicious formula of distribution of financial resources. During his speech, Prime Minister Shabazz Sharif decried the response of international institutions to Pakistan's appeals for funds after floods in 2022. The Premier urged the world to come forward in generous terms to provide an opportunity and a system and a mechanism which will satisfy the most vulnerable. At a bare minimum, the summit is a key moment for Pakistan and developing world as its objective is to set the foundations for a new global financing architecture to address simultaneously climate change, biodiversity and development challenges and help all countries achieve the sustainable development goals. Ladies and gentlemen, I am joined by two guests uh, in my studio. My first guest is Dr. Nasser Iqbal. He is head of Pakistan Institute of Development Economics by uh, Microeconomic Lab. Um, a leading economist in the country. Dr. Shabab, welcome you to the show. Thank you. And with him, I have Sultan Ali Haider, who is an expert of political economy. Sultan appears regularly on Fault Line. Sultan, I welcome you to the show. Thank you, sir. Uh, Doctor, first things first, what is the background of this conference? Because there are many conferences that have taken place in the past, ended up with rosy promises that could not materialize. I think when we start looking at this new pact, we think differently. Because the previously, uh, all the pacts are the, especially after the financial crisis, they were motivated by the other stakeholders. But this time, it was deliberated of effort by the Paris. So they actually come up with this idea that we have to come and organize a forum where we have to negotiate, where we have to discuss, where we have to streamline the issue. Because now there is like after this COVID and the, this financial crisis and also the uh, the recession in the global economy, increasing threat to environment and climate change would compel them to come up with a model that give an equal opportunity to not only to the developed country but also to the developing country. So now they are start thinking how we can engage developing country, those as you said, those are the mo most mostly recipient of this issue because they are not emitting CO2 and they are facing the, these issues. So now they come up with the idea that look this is a, a like a, a forum where they can debate those issues where can listen the voices of these uh, uh, developing countries especially if you look into the our premier over there he raised the issues like of developing countries so this is the forum where there is a chance that they would come up some sort of concrete step because promise was there in the last few summit but they never materialized because there might be a lack of action plan. There could be a possibility of lack of trust between the developed and the developing nation. So that compelled them because if no, they didn't tackle this issue at this moment, it would be late for both even developed and developing country. 
Uh, Dr. Shab, uh, do you also believe that the economic system uh, is largely hijacked by the global north? Yeah. Uh, because we see all of the countries in south going back to the global north and asking them for, for financial mercy. Uh, so do you believe that as an economist that the system, the global economic system that we inhabit is largely hijacked by so the global north? So if you look into the World Bank statistics, uh, these global north basically contributed six, more than 60% of the GDP of the world. So they have their say uh, in all kind of decision making, especially they have, uh, they are the basic contributing to these financial institutions, so they, 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 they have the strong word. But we cannot say that they, they are the only problem of this whole setup. We, we have to think differently because the developing country also must come up with the model because they have the different geography, they have the different needs and they have to come up with their own solution. So ultimately they hijack so many things but they also provide some sort of a, a way to discuss, to debate, to raise their issues. So, so we, as I like you said from the south, there must be a voices. So they, if we raise our voices so, then probably they start think, thinking differently. Sultan, would you like to comment on uh, the same question? The global north taking controls of the economic system that we live in. They, they are the one who call the shots. They are the one who decide the <coughs> fate of the countries that we call developing countries or the countries of global south. It's, it's a very personal opinion. So. In my opinion, it's like welcome to the real world. World is tough, and uh, the developing countries they wanted independence because North naturally those were the colonial powers, right? They ruled, and South wanted, and yes, they kept the resources. There's a lot of talk about how resources moved from South to North over the last few hundred years, and uh, how the for example the subways and all of those transportation systems, all of that investment happened through. Uh, the money that was sent by Africa or Asia or you know th th that kind of space but now that we are independent so it's more about putting our own house in order before we go and uh, ask them yes so uh, it's about uh, it's a tough world but I think uh, in addition to appealing to the humanity of the North, right? In the summer, just like uh, uh, the Dr. Saab was saying, uh, I think we should also be working on uh, what can we do about it and how we should be more uh, organized in uh, fixing our own house. Uh, Dr. Nasir, we are talking about uh, these ritual companies that are standing out of this conference. They're not uh, <laughs> present in the room, no. the room where countries are pleading their case, that we are not the one who are emitting this carbon. It is not us who are responsible, but the oil companies that have made money out of the carbon business, the, the companies that decide the fate and fortune of the economies are not inside the room. How do you see this? So you, if you, you are talking about the strikes and other events those happening over there uh, regarding these companies, you know, if we look into the multilateral world, in the multilateral world, these multinational companies have a stronghold in any type of policy, not only in developing country, but in the developed region, as I said, even in the north, these multilateral companies are the multinationals, they have the strong contribution to overall economy in, in any country. So you can't avoid, though it's look like they are, uh, like if you look into the five top uh, companies across the world, they are m emitting more than 50% of this, the entire pollution across the world, but they have the stronghold. You cannot avoid them. And if they go for a strike, what would be the future of, uh, of the, any country? Look, uh, if you look into the current scenario in, in uh, Russia and the e EU, they suddenly shift their movement from the green energy to again a coal energy. Why, why, why this was happening there? Because they, they know that the, any kind of company could influence any type of decision and they can influence your entire decision. They can even get the subsidies on the name of so many things. They can so many get the benefit despite everyone knows that they, they, they are the main ca cause, they are the main reason behind all this pollution. But what are the alternatives? We don't have any. But my question was primarily they are outside the room. Would, would it not have been a better idea to make them a part of this conversation, to, to charge them money that these poor countries are bleeding out of their environment? I think over the last one and a half decade, there is a discussion on it, how we can monetize this issue. 
because the, the developing countries especially they are raising their voices that we are the victim of this whole scenario. These are the, the big companies. They are getting everything out of this context, right? but we are not even paid out of these things. Even the, the in the last summit, they, they committed like 50 billion to, to support these poor countries, but nothing materialized. So that is a good idea to, to start negotiation because the ultimate solution is to start negotiating with these these countries, with these multilateral companies to come up with some sort of viable solution. I think this this forum basically meant to create that discussion because it was like a call by the Paris. So they intentionally invited all these uh, the stakeholder to come to give their ideas and come up some sort of solution. And I am very hopeful after this this summit, they, they start developing some working groups and those working groups probably come up with some sort of viable solution. Uh, Sultan, I, uh, uh, I would like to comment. Uh, Sultan, Sultan, I have yeah. to quickly move. We have just left with five minutes. Okay. Uh, IMF's uh, managing director also met uh, yeah. Prime Minister of Pakistan and while the meeting was going on, certainly Ministry of Finance and Pakistan's uh, mission to I'm a, uh, the IMF's mission to Pakistan uh, they started negotiating once again. Uh, we, s we saw some massive developments happening. Uh, some uh, perhaps additions in the budget are also coming. What exactly is happening? So, so one thing, uh, if uh, uh, I think we hear the, the speech of uh, the finance minister in the parliament today. So he was saying that uh, for the last two, three nights, so since, and it's the, uh, negotiation, there's some confusion I've heard locally people saying that uh, negotiation with the IMF uh, local office here. No, it was a discussion with the IMF office in Washington, D.C. So the finance minister was saying that the meetings are taking place as for Washington time. So these guys have been staying up all night and talking to them for the last two, three nights. So a lot of homework and headway has been happening. Parallel In parallel, there was this uh, meeting also and uh, the IMF MD did assure uh, the Prime Minister that uh, things will be sorted out and at times there are differences at uh, the working level. But, uh, no, but is it like a political statement that differences will be overcome or do we see something uh, material uh, in that? No, I, I do think there is uh, something material in that because this time it is, uh, IMF MD would not have uh, said so, right? So, it, it, so it, these are very encouraging remarks because now we are seeing, usually there would be statements as you were saying, right? This time it's about the review is coming to a conclusion and we are, we have made changes to the budget, slight adjustments to the budget in position of uh, new taxes, right? So, or the demand of IMF that imports uh, should be open and things like that, right? So, there are changes being happening, uh, have been happening. So, I do feel that uh, this time around, and there also lastly, some tweets about some well-placed journalists in uh, Washington, D.C., who are saying the program is happening. So, it appears to Do be Dr. Nasser, do you have uh, an update of this uh, subject? Yeah, I was like, uh, 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 couple of uh, like a, a few hours back I was discussing with the Vice Chancellor Dr. Nadeem about this issue what is happening on and how it will translate it. You know the, at the end they, when there is a di discussion there is a negotiation there would be a win-win situation at the end of this also. So this Paris summit was like a ideal uh, ideal situation for us to sell our uh, the, the, the country's economic situation to the global world and they definitely play their role in terms of making some sort of go ahead and as uh, it says that uh, now there is a, some sort of hope that uh, like government arrays, uh, arrays increase taxes up to 200 billion that would be the one indication and the, the IMF also knows that this is election year they have some limitations so they go with some sort of these things and the government also realized that if we couldn't give anything to IMF, it would be very difficult to patch up. So, I think no, they, they are on the right track. So, probably in the coming uh, days or the month, we will be able to have a good news. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Nasser. Thank you very much, Sultan Ali Haider, for being guest in the program. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, towards then, I'll only say that the government of Pakistan uh, is trying its level best. There are problems with regards to IMF's program. Uh, it is pushing Pakistan to a corner. Uh, toward the decisions that are actually very difficult for uh, a government that is elected uh, by the people of the country. These are unpopular decisions. But that said, IMF is always uh, thought to be lender of last resort and Pakistan is trying her level best to make sure that this deal goes through. We'll join you next week with another program. And until then, Allah Hafiz.